I, I feel a bit like I'm changing from the, um, the telescope view to the microscope view in, in this, this talk. I mean, the, the grand policy we've just heard about, what I've been talking about now is very, very small beer like beside it, but just a small case study of, of, of using resources. Um, and I've talked about the Open University because in a sense we, we are kind of following a, a, a traditional Open University model here. Um, but we're doing it in a way that's, that's or in, in a setting rather, that's very, very different from the other. Now, so what I'm going to talk about um, is, uh, first of all, the, the Masters by Distance Learning that we're starting up at Huddersfield, um, based upon a previous Masters by standard delivery, um, about the issues of finding and creating resources that we had. It's based around the idea of open education resources and their use in the Masters. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the students using those resources, and uh, we've had a couple of uh, pilot uh, modules running. And then I'll switch back to the Roxham results to talk about the wider use of the resources. The same resources that we're using on the Masters have been available um, around the world for, for some months. So what's been uh, made of those? And perhaps some point, uh, issues about further challenges to finish with. Um, the traditional Masters, which has been running for many, many, or well, a few decades actually, at Huddersfield, um, MSC in social and social evaluation um, has, um, has been to some extent based upon the reusable um, learning resources for some time. It had three modules, in fact, the first three mentioned here were based on using resource packs. And so, and again, following a standard kind of distance learning type uh, model, but of course with some face to face sessions as we could do because um, the students were on campus. So we followed the FRU textbook model, the course handbook, and some computer resources. And, and this was the time when the World Wide Web wasn't well developed, so uh, we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't use that. That was well liked by students, but over time the masters stopped recruiting as well, and so it was time to rethink how we delivered it and how we uh, um, how we um, attracted students to it. So I put forward the proposal of having a distance learning version of it to the school, who approved it and. Again, I suppose a little bit of funding. It's interesting, I've heard some talk about, about the, you know, the need for funding and so on in projects. Well, this project has um, a couple of thousand quid of funding, you could sell a few thousand quid. We have one um, placement student who's helping us with our creation of resources, the, the, the video work we're doing. And other than that, no special funding whatsoever. So it's, a, it's very much a, a standard kind of teaching model, if you like, of how you produce a new course. We follow the flipped classroom philosophy, that is that we're, we're expecting students to watch things off, on, you know, online and out of the classroom before they come online and discuss ideas. Um, and we're following the standard fee structure um, and we're using OER as much as we can. Our own OER, OERs are OERs that we've made and those that um, we've got from elsewhere. And I'll say something about that later on. And that's the school support we the team to create the courses. The problems we've got, well first of all there's the experience in the team. We have a well experienced team who have been teaching this master for some time, but they don't have much experience of either um, using resources or creating them, uh, and very little experience of, of online teaching either. Um, and that's a, actually proving quite a problem for us uh, in, in dealing with the QAA expectations and so on um, of the team. Um, there's little experience of, uh, of and infrastructure for new technology in, in the university uh, and in the school. Um, so we're having to build up uh, these things like, you know, how do we appear on the web and how do we combine together our blackboard learning uh, system along with other systems. And little understanding from the university, which I'm coming up against as the, the course leader, of how you market such things and how you use the OER to do that and so on. I mean, no understanding of this kind of marketing whatsoever. Key tasks we faced were converting what we had already into um, a form we could use in distance learning, creating OERs, and in the main this was creating videos. Um, and we did it the simple way, um, by essentially it's a form of lecture capture, um, although we're not capturing lectures as such, we're capturing the materials from the lectures. Um, and we also want to, to use some existing materials, there's quite a lot of stuff out there on research methods that can be used, I used it for many years in my own teaching. Um, so it's a matter of finding stuff, making sure it's the right kind of level and, and so on, and then embedding it into the uh, materials that could be used. So it's a bit of using what's there and creating our own. And we have to develop the skills of the teachers to do that, uh, both in finding things, but also particularly in making things. And, and uh, because most of the teachers don't have any experience of, of, of making videos. 
Um, and we needed to uh, also develop this idea of combining together the closed VLE with open pages that will, in a sense, advertise the course. We've actually run two pilot modules on a very, very small scale. I can't say how small, I can say how small it is, I'm overemphasizing how small it is. Um, these have been two modules with a total of about a dozen students on each at the best, um, um, but the attendance was even lower than that. So we've had online sessions with half a dozen students, which is not really a test of a large scale MOOC or anything like that, um, but it is a way of us getting some idea about what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong in preparing for it. The two modules were Social Research Methods, one I've been run for years, and all the lectures are on video, they've been on YouTube for a year or two. Um, the next one, Introduction to Qualitative and Quantitative Analysis, use some videos we have already and we created onto other new things as well uh, to support that. And brought in some other materials as well, um, particularly, uh, well in both actually, we use some existing materials from elsewhere that we haven't produced ourselves but exist outside as we are. And the teaching model we adopted on as a standard was, you know, the, the flip classroom idea, you watch something out, outside, read something before the session, look at something, uh, do an exercise perhaps uh, offline and then come to an online discussion where the results are exercised or a Q&A about the video, something like that that would engage the students in some kind of debate and conversation. Finding and checking existing ARs, well there's lots available, in fact, if I think next slide, yeah, um, no, not on that one, and I produced this for another project, a whole list of stuff on research methods, enormous amount of research methods uh, stuff available and it's a matter of looking through it we're finding it and the time to do all of that so if I go back to that slide um, there's lots of it there it's just simply the time needed to, to check it all there it's right and, and can support what's needed by the teachers and of course decisions about whether to use this core or complementary of course I have to say I found it quite hard to persuade colleagues to do this they seem on the whole to be happier producing their own materials or making a new video rather than looking and seeing something that exists. Uh, somehow it, it's, it's what you're used to do as, uh, as, a, as a lecturer, you create your own lectures rather than borrowing somebody else's, but even if there are very good ones out there to use. Um, I don't know why I slipped this one in here, but this is a previous um, survey I did last year. Um, uh, this is actually a survey of teachers of quality research methods. Um, but I was, I was quite astounded where this is where they looked for resources and YouTube, as you see in one of the other uh, papers here, YouTube is a very popular place to go to look for such things. Um, and uh, I think I, I highlighted the HEA website because the HEA funded that particular work um, down here. But uh, unfortunately, other things uh, can quite low down uh, by comparison. Um, so, you know, Jura is uh, not, not a, a particularly popular place for uh, these particular academics to go for. Okay, the second thing we did was look, look at things one thing, the second thing we did was to make some OERs. As I said, most of them were already made, um, the videos that had been produced, um, and we did some extra ones, uh, where, as we need, not, not a large number of them, um, and we used the green screen technique in the main, because that was something that academics found familiar, they could see what was there, they knew how to do it fairly well. One or two issues about how you support them in doing it, I mean, one thing I discovered was that uh, people have different lecturing styles. Some people do what I'm doing here, we read off the, the, the slides and just talk to them. Others like to have notes. And then, of course, the issue is if you're doing green screen, screen capture of, of a lecture, where do those notes go? And, um, well, obviously, a, a, an auto prompt would be a good idea, but we didn't have that. So we had to have some other mechanisms for, for giving people the notes that they could then read off in front of them. Um, there are lots of skills required here in producing the videos. I um, mean, you know, I've done quite a lot myself, so I have those skills, but, but other colleagues won't have those. You can't expect your average academic to have those skills. This is where you need technical support to do it. So making such resources does require, I think, technical support of that kind. Um, but where the academics come in is down here in terms of scripting and writing and working with the, the person who's editing the films and so on to, to make them. So there needs to be a good kind of work program between those two. Um, this is where the videos are at the moment. I've put them onto my YouTube channel. It's been there for about three years now. Um, so I just like to illustrate that that's there. So that's how the students find the things. Although I've embedded all of them into the, uh, the Blackboard uh, website for students to use. And that, that's where they came to watch them. 
The usefulness of doing this is I could then see what was going on through Google and YouTube analytics. I could look and see what's happening. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm repeating myself here. This is the mentoring. We, we, we basically, because we, had, we lacked that kind of um, um, experience of making these things, uh, we decided that the two of us who had some experience, both of online teaching and in my case of video making, uh, would kind of bend to our colleagues. And, and this is basically how we did it. I, I would show colleagues how to do things and, uh, and help them through and actually be with them. Uh, we sat into the, the live session with people online and helped them make sure they were doing the right things at the time and so on. Uh, so by that kind of mentoring process, uh, we could either help them make videos or, or select the ones they needed, um, give them quite kind of technical support they needed, particularly for editing, that's where the technicians came in. Um, and um, I think I've already said that point. Um, and oh yes, another point here, need to rethink the content. This is another interesting point that uh, several of the academics doing this actually talked about the way they actually rethink what they were doing in converting from a face-to-face -to, -face to a, an OER-based or a distance learning OER-based uh, model of, of presenting and teaching. Um, <clears throat> that's another thing, so that's just a, a, an image of one of the videos produced. So this is a colleague with a green screen approach, so that the background is simply later, uh, giving a talk, short talk. We tried to keep it quite short. This was about a 20 minute talk on uh, distance answers. And we used Adobe Connect for the, the, um, the distance learning uh, features and found this problematic. Uh, it works very well, given what it's doing, uh, but the interface is, is a very hard one to get to grips with. And, and a lot of staff were quite anxious about using it beforehand. And you can't show videos through it either, obviously, so we had to do the videos quite separately from it. Um, uh, but we did again use the mentoring approach. There were often one or two academics alongside the teacher in the first few sessions of doing their, their, their distance learning. This was the actual live being online with students discussing things and so on. So. The teaching experience, what, what did Macmillan think of this? Um, how did they use it? Well, some of them did demonstrations online, particularly used SPSS, actually using the software and showing how it worked. Through it, Adobe Connect, that worked fine. Uh, another was sharing coding, qualitative coding, so it was having people using Word, documents in Word, uh, marking them up with, with annotations and then sharing the documents. That worked less well. Um, and some of the things I did was offline discussion, so people would have a watch a video and then come to some discussion about some issues. Might have an exercise to do online, some questions to ask them about it and so on. And the, the student response to this was generally very, very positive, actually. Um, okay, they were. All the students, I should say, were our own PhD students doing this as part of their research training. So they're, in a sense, a, a, an easy audience to get to grips with. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, hard to engage because of that, perhaps. And, and it did engage them. Um, but not without problems. Um, the videos well, it took time to make the videos, that's one thing. Uh, we did have the, this central school to help us, though. Um, we tried to use Camtasia, and that was successful in most cases, but in one particular case, we lost an entire hour recording because it crashed and we couldn't reopen the file. So uh, learning some of the ins and outs of making longer Camtasia recordings is, is a lesson from that. We did push the Adobe Connect to its limits with, with things like screen sharing, where you're actually sharing what's happening on your screen with your software with others remotely. Uh, it worked, and, and that, that's good, but um, there are little glitches you need to remember as you use it. On the other hand, breakout groups, which we do want to use eventually with larger numbers, uh, we couldn't get to work at all. It was just so hard to get it to work in the way you wanted it to. The interface isn't, isn't that good, so we had problems there. And of course, a lot of our students didn't have headphones. When we recruit outsiders, we would expect that to have to be there, of course, but our own PhD students would just use their machines in their offices and so on, and they didn't necessarily have the headphones and wireless. So we had to do other things like the chat, chat as it says. As I said, all the videos were on YouTube, and one good thing about that was actually checking and seeing what's going on. So this is using YouTube analytics to see what was happening. What I did here was I, I dug into all the videos on my channel, including those that we're using, and then looked at only those that were coming through embed web pages. And all the, remember, all the videos we used for teaching were accessed through Blackboard with embedded code. So this, is, this would include all those videos. You can see the list down below. 
um, the 224 views from the UK would have been from the Huddersfield website. What's interesting is the, the, the periodicity of this, the, 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 the sudden jumps. And actually, when you're in the analysis, you can move the mouse over it and see exactly what day that was. Those big uh, peaks are happening on the day of the sessions we ran online. So the, the, the message I bring from this is that students watched it the morning before they wanted you know, the, the, the live sessions were coming on later on. And the numbers, but that's about tallying the numbers that, that, uh, that were with our students. Of course, I can't be absolutely sure there are not other students in here coming on to our website, but um, those coming from other countries will be in different colours, so you can see there are one or two groups there coming in. So that's it, peaks coincide with today's webinars, students watch this for the online sessions. Attendance at the online sessions are relatively low, about 50% of the students. Um, but when talked about it, when we talked about it to them, students did enjoy what they were doing. There was good engagement, good positive feedback from them, so And the students view the videos, and well, they like the ability to pause and replay, and this is a bit said many times about using videos like this. Um, some of you used textbooks and the readings that we gave them, um, but um, there was generally approval of the video approach. Um, most watched the videos before the sessions, um, and did like the links with what was in the session. So that, that link between watching the video and then doing something with it just a few hours later was what they particularly appreciated. Um, and they didn't go back to it as much other times later on. They did read reminders though, in, in the reminders to, to watch it beforehand was quite important. So that's, that's our experience of using, creating OERs, making them available to everybody. Um, Oh, what's interesting is one of the OERs we've made for this, this, this particular course, with, as I said, there were 12 students on this module, um, has had 200 and something views in the last three, two months on YouTube. So obviously somebody else is watching it other than our students. It's, it's not just you know, the 12 students who watched it, there, there are some others coming in as well. Uh, there's a lot of news beyond the course. Uh, all of these things are openly available with the you know, CC. So I thought I'd say one or two things. How much time have I got left? Um, three minutes. Three minutes. All right. Well, I'll have to speak through this very quickly and, and just pick one or two things. Um, about the, um, the, the you know, re reception of these resources beyond the course, so to speak. Because part of what we're doing is not just teaching the students, but also making those resources available to others so they can reuse them. And I've, as I said, I've been on YouTube for some time, so I'm getting feedback from students and teachers about their use. Um, and um, it's often postgraduates and, and their teachers who are coming on. Here's one postgrad um, who's a medic who's been watching the videos and obviously appreciates them. Uh, she's um, a surgeon from, uh, from Taiwan. Um, I've crossed out some of the names and things here. Um, here's someone very recently, Cassandra, so I'm um, who thinks I'm a fantastic lecturer. So, uh, Obviously, this is the students come on to watch the video at a different kind of uh, a level. So you get a lot of positive feedback like that. As I said before, a lot of these um, people are watching videos through embedded sites, and it's particularly interesting where the embedding is happening. So obviously, people come straight to YouTube. And the majority do actually. Something like ninety percent of people go straight to YouTube and watch the videos that way. But quite a few come through embedded um, through web pages where the code becomes embedded. So have a quick look at that. This is a list of the, the top ones. Just to give a summary of that, um, there are quite a lot of UK universities who are using the, the, the materials. So, we've got uh, there's some uh, British and so it's American ones like Maryland, uh, South Georgia, and so on, Australian, New England, and so on. So, you know, mainly English language, of course, they're using them. One or two that surprised me, Lamp School, which is a, a, a combination of 12 private liberal arts colleges, um, come up as a, a common user of the a Mara site, which is a real discovery to me, which, which is a, a crowdsourced translation site. Apparently someone in Denmark has been making Danish translations of these videos, and I think that's one to look out for. I might try and do more with that, try and get translations of the videos down to the see and watch elsewhere. And then another one surprised me was eCollege. Um, not so much that it's Pearson and therefore it's commercial and so on. Um, it's more to the fact of what do I do about it? What, 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 what's my view of this? And um, it appears to producing software that's used by other colleges uh, to show you know, their materials. And they're embedding that, 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 that my, my videos into that. 
Um, is that legitimate open charity college usage or not? Or should Pearson ask me? I don't know. It's not Pearson doing it, it's the colleges who are using the software. So it's an interesting kind of in-between situation, and I'm not surprised. Um, oh, a couple of web pages that are, oh, here's one I'm surprised by. This, actually, this group of students didn't get in touch with me, asked me permission to, to use the videos. Um, in, in this group of postgraduates uh, with a, an Arabic website in how to do a PhD, basically. Um, and that's somebody at uh, Doncaster College who's using it for, for her work. Um, and she, she's done several papers on this, I know. I've also done a survey, this is very preliminary, it's still in operation. I've only had something like um, 17 responses so far on this survey. Trying to survey the people who've been using the videos on my channel. So the 157 of them I contacted, those that were users, and they, they'd signed up in some way and made comments about them. Um, 35 people actually emailed me directly about it, uh, usually asking permission to use the stuff. And I asked them what they thought about it. So here, very, very quickly, I've got a few seconds left. Five seconds? Yeah. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, so here's what they said, um, and this, you recognize the Bristol on my survey, uh, thinking they're just cheap and cheerful uh, results here. Um, what do they say about how they judge the videos that they find? Um, one thing that interests me with this one here, the, the trusted university, previous studies that I've been involved with found that was quite an important issue, but here much less so. It seemed like the, the, the quality of what was there was more important, or, or they somehow made the issues understandable or something like that. Um, People watched them quite intelligently, that they used the videos in an intelligent way, a whole range of ways of using it. It wasn't just watch the video and that's it, but they take notes and they, they re-watch them and stop them and so on. They put them in class in different other ways. So uh, an enormous variety of ways that the, the material is being used. Um, I was interested with this one because I, I um, well, I mean, they used it as part of the talk session and I, I do that quite a bit in, in my teaching and use videos in, in the lessons. Oh, so that's, that's becoming more common. Um, oh, here was an interesting one. That most people were not actually doing anything more with it. They're simply showing it. They're showing the whole video, um, or possibly a timed extract. But um, very few making other resources for the videos, doing anything better than without reusing the video at all. I was very pleased by this one because it seems shows at least in the few users who replied, just eight people who replied to this question. Um, that um, <coughs> they are becoming aware of the Creative Commons license, but that might be simply the group that, that I'm accessing, accessing here as the example. Another interesting change, I think, was relevance, not reputation. Relevance of the video to the needs was more important than anything to do with reputation of the university or the academic involved and so on. Um, and that's certainly a change from, again, previous studies I've been involved with where the, the reputation was made. So that's one of the conclusions. It can be done. Um, we're still a little doing it. Uh, flip classes work quite well online. The OERs are being used, and the, the words getting out there, but they're not much modified from the way they're created. And it still takes an enormous amount of time and effort to find resources and use them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, but reuse them in other videos. I've done it, but you need to, to know how to do it. You need an yes. editor, you need a you know, digital editor to do it with, you know, how to grab them off screen, all kinds of things. So it is, it is very difficult. So I'm not surprised they're not being reused. It's not quite right. Yeah. I think there is a barrier there to, to that kind of reuse. You know. I did wonder whether people might use it in other ways, in some, you know, like some other way in which they're being used, like putting them onto a DVD or something like that. But that's, there's certainly no evidence for that. But I think you're right, the, the barrier is. 